Hi there. So in this video, we're going to cover both DNA and RNA vaccines, as well as viral vector vaccines. Our, in our previous video, we talked about subunit vaccines. And in these vaccines, the goal was to find a surface antigen, some molecule that you would like the immune system to recognize, identify, uh, and mount a new immune response to, such as a neutralizing antibody response. Take the gene for that um, protein, the gene that codes for the instructions to make that protein, put that gene into some organism in the laboratory, such as a yeast cell, generate that protein in the lab, and inject that protein into individuals, hoping that they will make an immune response to that uh, protein. So that was a subunit vaccine, which we talked about in the previous video. DNA and RNA vaccines are very similar to that. Um, the difference is that instead of making this uh, viral protein in the laboratory and then injecting it into the body, it turns out in this one, you are the factory that makes the protein. So this uh, is um, a good uh, medium place between the uh, v viral vaccines, the live attenuated virus vaccines, and the subunit vaccines, because this kind of mimics an infection because you're making this viral protein in your cells. So this um, non-self protein is made in your cells and can provoke a stronger immune response as opposed to just being injected with a protein um, and trying to provoke an immune response. So let's see how this works. So again, um, if you have a pathogen you'd like to make a vaccine against, you identify some molecule that you would love to have an immune response to, for example, a surface antigen. It would be great if we can uh, generate an antibody response against that surface antigen. So as we talked about in the subunit vaccine video, you clone the gene for the surface antigen. And in a subunit vaccine, uh, or uh, that you would take this gene, you put it into an organism such as a yeast cell, in the lab and generate that protein. Well, here, the DNA, for this is a DNA vaccine, the DNA itself is the vaccine. So this gene is inserted into a piece of DNA, such as a plasmid or some artificial chromosome, and that DNA is injected into the body. Now, what's gonna happen to that DNA once injected into the body? Well, the goal would be to get that DNA into body cells into dendritic cells so that the cells will read this gene and transcribe it and translate it into protein. Now, this is not the easiest thing to do to convince DNA to get into body cells. And so there are definitely limitations to this. And this is probably one of the reasons why uh, at the time of recording this video, there are no FDA approved DNA vaccines because there takes, there's a lot of tinkering that has to occur in these DNA vaccines uh, in terms of getting the DNA into cells, getting cells to uptake the DNA. So when you're injecting these DNA vaccines, it's not just naked DNA, it's typically DNA with some um, coating, some either protein or lipid coating to convince the cells to uptake the DNA. The DNA has to find its way into the nucleus where it can be transcribed. Um, and then you have translation in the cytoplasm and you make the protein. Uh, this is not trivial to convince our body cells to take in foreign DNA and uh, transcribe and translate it into protein. But that's the goal of DNA vaccines. Uh, the, there are some uh, approved veterinary DNA vaccines, but there are currently, as of the recording of this video, no FDA-approved human DNA vaccines. But again, the goal would be to convince our cells and our body to make the protein from the virus using this piece of DNA. And if we did this, then we could generate an immune response to this protein, B-cell response, a T-cell response, as we talked about in previous videos. And, um, you know, since we're making the protein in our cells, that protein is going to be processed uh, via antigen processing and presentation 
on MHC class one molecules and MHC class two molecules. So we can present this to both CD4 helper T cells and CD8 cytotoxic T cells. And the goal would be to activate uh, a B cell and T cell response such that we will make neutralizing antibodies uh, that might neutralize the, uh, the pathogen if we're ever really exposed to it, or make CD4 and CD8 T cells that would recognize peptides from the uh, pathogen and mount a uh, cell-mediated immune response. But CD4 cells, uh, um, you know, responsible for inflammation and helping, and CD8 cells killing virally infected cells. So. Uh, DNA vaccines are very similar to subunit vaccines um, in that we are generating an immune response to one specific protein of the pathogen. In a subunit vaccine, you were injected with the protein. In a DNA vaccine, you were injected with the instructions on how to make that protein. But again, no FDA-approved DNA vaccines uh, are on the market right now. Well, now let's go to RNA vaccines, because RNA vaccines are actually very similar to DNA vaccines, uh, but uh, they have some advantages. So here again, we identify some surface antigen we would like to make an immune response to, uh, clone the gene for that antigen. But now, instead of working with the DNA, that DNA can be transcribed in the laboratory quite easily to generate mRNA that would translate into that protein. And so in an RNA vaccine, the vaccine is the mRNA. So individuals are injected with a formulation of mRNA. Typically, we mix with either some sort of proprietary uh, lipid or protein mixture that allows that RNA to be taken into body cells dendritic cells, other professional antigen-presenting cells. So now our cells have taken in mRNA. mRNA molecules are much simpler than DNA molecules. The DNA uh, in a DNA vaccine uh, might have to have a lot of genetic elements to convince the cell to transcribe and then translate that gene. Um, whereas an mRNA vaccine would just be mRNA, that all it needs to be done is find the ribosome and translate it into protein. So there we go. We can convince ourselves to translate this mRNA into protein. Now, this was not trivial to, to figure out how to get cells to uptake mRNA, because that is not necessarily a normal process that happens in the cell, in, the, in human cells. But in fact, you can convince cells to take in mRNA. And so um, if cells can take in this mRNA and translate it into protein, now that you have protein, that protein, which is again made in your cells, can be broken down by antigen processing and presentation process uh, and presented on both MHC class 1 and MHC class 2 molecules, allowing for the activation of both CD4 and CD8 helper T cells. When this protein is made, it can also be released um, from dead and dying cells, allowing your B cells to ex be exposed to this protein. And hopefully you have a B cell with a B cell receptor that can recognize this antigen mounting an immune response, a B cell response. So if this is the case, then you can in fact generate um, a neutralizing antibody response, a cell mediated response to this surface antigen um, thus giving you immunity to the pathogen. So that is an mRNA vaccine, or, or also known as an RNA vaccine. Um, this is relevant at the time of recording this video because uh, we are um, about almost a year into the COVID-19 pandemic. COVID-19 disease caused by the coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. And so uh, this video is being recorded in December of 2020. And um, when this virus was identified at the beginning of 2020, um, it's a coronavirus, its genome was sequenced, and it's known that the spike protein is very important for this virus attaching to human cells and allowing it to infect human cells. 
So very early in 2020, the, the SARS-CoV-2 genome was sequenced, the spike gene was identified, and companies decided to, many companies decided to try to generate um, uh, vaccines against this spike protein. So there are companies that tried to go the subunit vaccine route where they made spike protein in the lab and injected spike protein into organisms trying to mount an immune response. Um, the two vaccines right now that are being um, uh, heralded as possibly allowing um, a strong immune response are mRNA vaccines by the company Moderna and the company Pfizer with, uh, along with the company BioNTech. Both of these have um, very good results from mRNA vaccines, and these vaccines are uh, mRNA that code for the spike protein. And so, now again, these vaccines don't have just mRNA, and they're, they have other chemicals in them, lipids, proprietary chemicals that allow for the efficient absorption of these mRNA into human body cells, allowing the body cells to produce the protein via translation of this mRNA and that spike protein uh, having a good immune response. So again, the goal for any vaccine is to have both a good uh, B cell response and T cell response, so very adaptive immunity. You want to generate antibodies against this protein. You want to have T cell receptors that recognize um, peptides that are broken down from this protein so that if you are in fact infected by the pathogen, that your immune system will recognize the pathogen and clear the pathogen and prevent disease. And currently, um, and this is true for many vaccines, um, it is not always necessarily known if the vaccine will prevent infection completely or if infection occurs, maybe it will lessen or viral disease, the lessen the symptoms. So uh, there is current research going on um, into examining how well these vaccines work. Do they pre completely prevent the infection or maybe they don't prevent the infection, the uh, infection can still occur, but the infection is cleared so rapidly that disease does not occur. Uh, and again, those experiments are ongoing. So it's important to understand RNA vaccines. And again, there are, uh, there's maybe one FDA approved RNA vaccine um, as of today. I think there's one, it's either zero or one. Um, so this is a fairly new technology um, advanced rapidly in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The last um, vaccine type we're going to talk about is again very similar to the DNA and RNA vaccines. It's called a viral vector vaccine. So again, you're delivering the genetic material for the instructions for one of these viral proteins, but instead of injecting a person with DNA or injecting with RNA, you're injecting them with a virus that carries the instructions for the virus you want to make a path, uh, an immune response to. What does that mean? All right, again, let's say there's some pathogen you want to generate a vaccine to. Um, again, you clone the gene for that protein that you want to have an immune response to, and now we're inserting that gene into a harmless virus. And so the virus is a delivery mechanism for the DNA, for the gene. So what's a harmless virus? There are adenoviruses, there are pox viruses, there are retroviruses. These are viruses that scientists that work in the lab, they can work in the lab with them easily. They can genetically engineer these viruses to carry any gene they want. Well, pretty much any gene. And so um, the virus is the screen virus. And again, it could be an antivirus, a pox virus. All it is is a delivery mechanism for the gene that you want to have an immune response to. So now you're injecting individuals with a virus, not the virus that could make you sick, injecting with a virus that typically does not make you sick, and uh, infecting body cells with it. So all it is is a way to deliver DNA into cells, or RNA if you're talking about retroviruses. But now that you've delivered it into cells, the cells will 
um, make the protein you're interested in, and again, mount a B-cell and a T-cell response. So viral vector vaccines, now they can have their downsides as well because um, if you're injecting somebody with a virus, they could have a reaction to that virus. They could already be immune to that virus. So um, some individuals, for example, pox viruses, um, if you're already immune to, let's say, vaccinia virus, then um, because of, let's say, you got a smallpox vaccine, then using a pox virus to carry a gene into your cells might not work efficiently because you already maybe your immune system might repel that virus. So there are definitely limitations to viral vaccines. Same thing, for example, with retroviruses. Um, there is some danger in um, affecting your own genomic DNA uh, with these uh, viral DNA pieces. So there are downsides to viral vector vaccines. But um, there is a current uh, viral vaccine um, that is being tested and has shown promise against SARS-CoV-2. And this is a vaccine uh, generated by the University of Oxford in conjunction with AstraZeneca. They have an adenovirus that is carrying the spike gene. And so when individuals are given this viral vaccine, um, this virus, this adenovirus, infects their cells. It doesn't replicate. All it does is really deliver the spike gene into their cells, allowing their cells to make spike protein and thus mount an immune response to the spike protein. So those are viral vector vaccines. So that brings us to the end of the different types of vaccine. And again, um, the whole goal of this is to help the immune system generate a strong adaptive immune response, B cells and T cells, that hopefully will either give you lifelong immunity or give you enough of an antibody response um, or a T cell response that will either repel the infection, prevent you from becoming infected, or if you become infected, lessen the viral disease.